This is the YouTube channel Optics Realm, talking about optical engineering, lens design. This is Optics Tutorial 13, Field Stops, and Introduction to kind of System Engineering Topics. We're going to talk about field stops. Last session we talked about aperture stops that control the F number. Now we're going to talk about the aperture that controls the field as well as introduce just some kind of optical engineering concepts, really stop control and pupils, and as a means to understand and solidify these concepts, we're going to talk and look at daisy chaining optical systems together and see what the implications to stops and fields are. I put this warning up and I say danger, these are some challenging concepts and I'm bouncing a little bit and I want to thank uh, my coworkers, specifically Ken's project management group, for helping me kind of lay this one out. There's a picture of Ken as a superhero from our marketing department, and uh, all him and his team, I really do appreciate it. Some definitions, or not definitions, some concepts. The field stop is the aperture in the system that limits the field of view, that controls the field of view. For instance, a common example is if they're just standing in your house and you look out through a window out at the outside world, that window is controlling the field of view. In most optical systems, it's the detector plane that's going to control your field of view, but there's cases where other surfaces may control the field of view. So here is a layout showing a simple double gauss, and this detector plane is going to be your field stop. And I make the distinction to say this is an imager and it does, because it does not have an intermediate image. And that distinction will become very important later. Now here is a case where we have a re-imager. There is an intermediate stop here. This is a Keplerian A focal. And you can see the detector in this case is your eye, this rather large eye. And the detector, your retina, is huge. You have this huge field of view, this cone right here. But that's not going to limit your field of view. Where this comes to an intermediate image, there'll be an aperture here, and that would be your field stop. That limits how much you can see in the optical system. And again, because it's got an intermediate image, this could be called a re-imager. There could be other locations that limit your field, and I'm going to call these a pseudo field stop just for the lens design purists that believe that, you know, your, your field stop is at an intermediate image. Here's a case where we have a wide field of view system, and this is at a Z-Max. The blue rays are on axes, the green rays are positive 0.707 field of view, and the red rays are negative full field of view, and I'm splitting, I'm changing the signs so we can see what's going on with the rays. Your aperture stop is located here. Usually your field stop is the detector, but suppose you put an aperture up here. For some reason, maybe you have to make this environmentally durable, it's going in space or it's going underwater, and you've got a window right here that's going to block part of the green rays, and in this case, all of the red rays. And you can see the red rays are totally vignetted, cutting your field down, whereas the green rays are partially vignetted. So this would be like a, another field stop or a pseudo field stop. Sometimes you've got to consider the optical system as your field stop. For instance, let's suppose this double gauss is designed for one size detector or sensor, say half inch format or an eight millimeter image diameter. So this blue is the eight millimeter image diameter. And over this field, you've got low aberrations, high contrast, little wavefront error and um, no vignetting and good illumination. But suppose you buy this and put it with and, and match it with a larger detector, say outside here. Now first you're going to see there's some vignetting here. So over this annular ring, and let's, let's suppose it's a, a larger format, say a two-thirds inch format, and that's an 11 millimeter image diameter, these red, this red angular ring here, you're going to have higher aberrations. You may have higher aberrations. You have lower contrast, and uh, you could have poor illumination. So this is a case where you might consider your optics as your uh, limiting your field, not necessarily your field stop. There are cases. Now this uh, this is a similar picture to the Keplerian, but this is coming to a focus, and it's got an intermediate image. In this case. Your detector 
array is your field stop. We do have an intermediate image here, and I'm going to introduce the concept of a Leo stop or a glare stop, sometimes it's referred to as. Um, your entrance exit pupils up here and your entrance pupils on the front objective. Why would you put why would you put a stop here? Why would you put an aperture at the intermediate image? Well, there could be stray light sources outside your field of view, the sun, or if you're at the you're at a sports event and there's large floodlights outside your field of view, um, this could cause stray light. So what happens is this light enters into the entrance pupil and gets into the optical system and it could bounce off some internal housing structure back to your detector and cause, cause problems. How do you avoid that? Well, if you put in an aperture stop, I'm um, sorry, if you put in an aperture here and you want to... Um, to block that stray light, that's called a glare or a Leo stop. And you want to oversize that from the image. Because if you don't, then this becomes your field stop. Now I'm going to switch back to aperture stops in pupils. Previously, in this, we're talking fields. I'm jumping back to apertures. There's some graphics showing the difference between an aperture stop and a field stop. So on the left, we're changing the iris. The iris is growing and increasing, and you can see that the F cone is varying, or the numerical aperture, and that's going to that's going to control your aberration balancing, and it's going to control illumination, how much light gets back to your image plane. As opposed to the field stop on the detector, it's going in and out, and you can see that the, the field of view is increasing and decreasing. If you look at the chief ray, say the green ray here, and I know it's moving around, it's going to be changing angle. So that's the distinction between an aperture and a field stop. I have these uh, animated uh, GIFs. GIFs. Um, my teenager makes fun. I always say it wrong. Um, I've got these on my website if you want to hike them. And likewise, if you oversize these stops, on the left, if your aperture stop gets larger than it was designed for, you may hit a point where another aperture in the system becomes the aperture stop. And you can see in the, this double gauss, it might be the front of this flint right here. And in a field stop, if you increase the field, you may end up with vignetting. You can see these, these uh, 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 F cones versus field are getting smaller. You're, you're vignetting. And there'll be a limit to how much field you can make. Pupils, like images, are going to have real and virtual pupils. So I was saying real images, uh, real pupils at one point, and someone said, well, you know, what's a fake? Well, no, the, the opposite of a real pupil isn't a fake, it's a virtual. On the left, in the cases we've been looking at with a double gauss, you've got a virtual aperture stop. This, this I'm sorry, a virtual entrance pupil. This entrance pupil is inside the optical system as opposed to a real pupil, it's located outside. In one case, you can't, you can't physically touch the virtual, you can't physically touch the pupil. In the, in the real case, you can. You can put an object there. So if you want a real pupil, you're going to have to have an intermediate image. So here's a case of an, a Keplerian afocal. And let us suppose that the aperture stop is the eye, and it's back here. So to find out where this pupil is located, to find out where this pupil is located, the distance from the stop to the eyepiece becomes the object, and then you use the imaging equations to locate where the pupil is. And I know we're going from right to left. We usually go left to right. And if you take the objective away, if you just look at this eyepiece, here are the rays drawn to show how to, how to determine where the pupils are. You can use the lens maker's equation for this is presented for a Cartesian coordinate system, or you can use my favorite um, nomograph, imaging nomograph. Now, real pupils, if you want a real pupil, I just want to hammer home, you, you need an intermediate image. So here is a case with this Keplerian. You have a real, you have an aperture stop in the back. You go through a positive eyepiece, through an intermediate image, into a real pupil. You can see that here. And that having a pupil here is going to keep the diameter of this objective lens small. As opposed to a Gaussian afocal, if you 
you have your eye pupil back here, the entrance pupil is virtual, it's inside, and you can see the from the green to the blue rays, you're gonna wander, and that objective diameter is going to be much larger. Said another way, let us suppose that we've designed these systems so the eye, the iris in your eye is not the limiting aperture, but the objective is. So in the Keplerian, you're gonna have an aperture stop out here, and it's gonna to come to a real pupil. And this is a case where if you look at a, uh, like a rifle scope or a uh, microscope objective, you can see there's a spot that you naturally put your eye on. As opposed to a Galilean, you can't do that. The, the, the pupil where your eye wants to go is virtual, and you physically can't put your eye in that. So that's the distinction between uh, a real pupil and a virtual pupil. And I screwed up my animations here. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna go back and fix it. So this is just a picture to show my brain hurts. We bounced from stops, field aperture, and we've talked about real and virtual aperture stops. And why am I doing that? Well, I want to solidify the concepts of pupils in image and entrance space. And I want to. I want to teach you when you look at an optical system to tell. What's the field stop? What's the aperture stop? So you can rapidly discern what the system is doing. And we're going to do that by daisy chaining optical systems together. But first, I want to run a thought experiment. Now, here's a layout of a system. And I'll ask you, and I'll leave this up for a little bit, what is, the, what is this optical system? And as a hint, you want to ask yourself, where's the aperture stop? Where is the field stop? Now, I'll give you some caution. This is a trick question. If you have only one answer, I'm going to say you're wrong. Because let's suppose you say it's a one-to-one -one telecentric. The center is the aperture stop. On the right is the detector. And ray color depicts different fields. If you say that's the answer, I'll say you're wrong. Because it's really a one-to-one -one afocal Keplerian. Where the center is a field stop and the, and the right is an aperture stop. Again, color depicts different fields. So... You need to train your mind to be flexible and, and understand what the original intent of the optical system is. So all of these pictures here are, are two different images. And of course, the famous one is this uh, picture of a young lady looking out of the plane or an old lady looking, uh, into the, looking uh, down to the left. So the question now is, can we daisy chain two optical systems together? Let's say a double Gauss and a double telecentric system. So here's a double Gauss, and here's a double telecentric. Does this work? What does it equal? And hopefully, we could say the system focal length is just simply the double Gauss focal length times the magnification of the telecentric. This only works if you match the pupils. In other words, you place the exit pupil of the double Gauss onto the entrance pupil of the telecentric. Said another way, you want to match these chief ray angles. And I'm showing them here in red, and notice they're not matched. Said another way, you've got to match the Lagrange and Altendu. So, let's give an example of a mismatched pupil. On axis, everything's going to be fine. It's going to work. You're going to get a nice on axis image through. When you go off axis, again, you need to match these pupils and these chief rays. And in this case, this, this thing I'm showing here, this is not happening. So what happens? We're not matching. I'm drawing these triangles. This red triangle here is showing that it's not going to couple into the double telecentric. So everything right here, all that light is simply going to be lost. You're going to have low light illumination down on the, on the edge of the detector. You can increase or decrease aberrations and change your optical performance as well. How do you get around this? Well, if you put a field lens right at the intermediate image, you can use this lens to relay or to image the pupils from one to the other. So the double gauss exit pupil is saved right here. Take the double gauss away, and now you can see the, the lens is some distance D away from the exit pupil. And now you just use the imaging equations to put this pupil onto where the telecentric is. Now, this is a simple case because the telecentric, by definition, the pupil 
equals that infinity. So this field lens, in this case, just has to collimate the pupil. So the focal length of this particular field lens has to be whatever that distance d is. Very simple. So when you do that, you couple all your light in at the edge of the field. Does this change the system focal length? No, it doesn't, doesn't because the system focal length is proportional roughly to the power of each lens times the marginal ray height. And in this case, the marginal ray height is zero. So this could be a short or a very long focal length, and it's not going to change your optical system focal length. There's some caveats. If there's scratches or dust on this field lens, they may be imaged right onto your detector, which would cause image poor image quality. If you're using this as a high, in a high power laser and uh, you're focusing this high power laser into an optical media, you could blow your lens. And in addition, putting this lens here is going to change the balance of field curvature through these systems. And we'll discuss what that is in upcoming videos. In some cases, you want to change your field curvature back and forth. A, a way around the problems with the field lens and putting it at an image, you could just put a telecentrating lens. In last video, we talked how to do that, so I'm not going to exasperate and go through that again. So in this case, I want to ask you, where are the stops? And I really wish you take aperture out of here. So what, what, what system... Which assembly controls the stops? You've got to worry about the field stop. In this case, you could have the detector, or you could have this field lens, and the aperture stop. You could have an iris in the double telecentric. You can have an iris within the double gauss. And the answer is whichever clips or vignettes more. And you know, this would be a cool system because you could use your detector as the field stop. And you know, you might even want to put an iris back here to control stray light, who knows? Or you undersize or oversize this lens to be, uh, I'm sorry, a glare stop, a VO stop. Some definitions, field stop, intermediate image, Leo stop, re-imager, imager, real pupil, virtual pupil. I suppose at some point I'll have to take all my definitions and put them on my website for reference, but there's probably many sites on the web for this sort of stuff. Here's the homework. The first two are designing a gal, uh, uh, an afocal. The first is a Galilean and reporting where the entrance pupil is. The second is a Keplerian and reporting what the field is based on the field stop at the intermediate image. That's a reticule. reticule can't speak. And finally, we're uh, giving some numbers for a double Gauss and a double telecentric and asking, uh, asking some questions there about a field lens and what is controlling it. If you have any any questions or comments relevant to this topic, the best thing to do is comment down below. I'm, I'm pretty far behind with a lot of my emails and even the comments in the YouTube channel. I apologize for that. And uh, there's other, other media here you can get a hold of me. Thank you so much. I really appreciate uh, you watching, subscribing, and supporting this channel. Have a good one.